Hello, everybody. We will be getting started shortly. So thank you for coming. Oh, man, there's a lot of troublemakers in here. <laughs> this is always the the most awkward part is just waiting for everyone to yeah just cue in just start dancing. <laughs> Or act like I didn't know anyone was going to be here. Just vacuuming. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hi. I wasn't expecting you there. Yeah, it's so weird. Well, I guess I'll sit down and talk. For those who have just joined us, welcome. We will be getting started shortly. Awesome. So while uh, more people filter in, I just wanted to say hello. Um, tonight is our lovely event with Dave Jorgensen and Professor Chris White. Uh, we are very excited to have you all here. My name is Anna Workowski and I work as the Assistant Director of Alumni Engagement for DePa, uh, and I'm a 2019 graduate. And so I have the awesome uh, privilege of getting to introduce these two superstars. Um, and I will do that now. So, um, Professor Chris White is an award-winning playwright and screenwriter whose debut novel, The Life List of Adrian Mandrick, was published by Touchstone Books by Sh Simon and Schuster in 2018. It was called Stunningly Honest by the Chicago Review of Books, Intense and Poignant by the Library Journal, and with a love life affirming conclusion that reminds us that endangered species aren't the only ones that need to change and adapt in order to, to, to survive by the New York Times. White's plays have been produced nationally and internationally and her play Rhythms won the Helen Hayes Award for Outstanding New Play. She received an award of merit at the Women's Independent Film Festival in LA for her feature length screenplay, Weasel in the Icebox, and her short film, Mud Lotus, was an official selection at the US festivals. Professor White is a professor of English at DePauw and teaches creative writing and lives with her family near the town of Bainbridge, Indiana. And you can find out more about her on her website. Now for Dave, Dave Jorgensen is a Kansas City native and former Eagle Scout, and he received his bachelor's degree in English writing from DePauw in 2013. At DePauw, his love for video production began, and he interned for the Colbert Report during the 2012 election, which he was able to attain through an alumni connection. Afterwards, for something to do, he created the pre-recorded late night show with his friends, which became a huge success. Even I remember it uh, when I was a student. After graduating from DePauw, Jurgensen worked as a creative content producer for the Independent Journal Review, as well as a host of Burnt Popcorn Productions, which he still affiliates with today. He started working at the Washington Post in 2017, where he produces content such as short takes, where he interviews children on current events for the team's Department of Satire. In May 2019, the Washington Post TikTok was started and has since gained over 780,000 followers and amassed millions of views. Welcome, Dave and Chris. Now, if you have questions for Dave or Chris while the event is going on, you are more than welcome to submit them during the Q&A, but we will have time at the end for all of your questions, all those burning thoughts, uh, you can submit them at the end. So I will let them take it away. Hi, Dave. Hi. I still want to call you Professor White, and it's really breaking my brain. So I'll just <laughs> alternate between Chris and Professor White. <laughs> it sounds good. So good okay. to see you again, although I see you all the time on TikTok. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of your, you probably know this, but I'm, I'm one of your most, I know you have a lot of fans, but I'm always there checking it out. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, I'm aware. Seeing you, uh, evaluating. In the, in the TikTok comment section? <laughs> Are, I are you stuck in Florida? Uh -huh. Anyway, it's really great to be here with you tonight. Um, you so we, we had a couple classes together um, when you were a student at DePauw. We 
We had a screenwriting workshop together, upper level writing course, and your senior seminar where in which you wrote a full length screenplay. Correct? I remember, I, yes, you were uh, very encouraging with that screenplay. <laughs> well, it was very good. Um, loved having you as a student. Um, so so I'll, get, I'll get to it. Um, have some questions for you. Uh, first, isn't it true that you are the first TikTok creator for a major newspaper? How did you make this happen? And how did you get from DePaul to the Washington Post? Ooh, okay, I'll start with I'll start with TikTok and then I'll memento backwards. Um, so uh, basically, with yes, that is true that I was the first. Um, we we were the first news organization on TikTok, and then a lot of others followed to the point where some of them are kind of copying what we do, um, and I mean that positively. Um, and so yeah, the way that happened was basically I, I kind of stumbled on TikTok like late 2018. And I saw the one thing that really intrigued me about it was that people were just using uh, commercial music, you know, just Disney songs or whatever, and they could use them for free for 15 seconds and put any video with it. And as someone who uh, mostly edits, you know, up until that point, I was mostly just doing a lot of video editing and some hosting, but mostly editing. I was like, this is amazing. I can't like, I don't have to go work for a company that has to pay a million dollars to use this Britney Spears song. I can just do it right now uh, for 15 seconds. And so I was really into this, that part alone. And then I saw, I started reading more about TikTok and already at this time, this is almost two years ago, there was already a billion downloads of the app. And so, you know, as someone that was hired at the Washington Post to bring in younger audiences, um, like specifically Gen Z or millennials through the YouTube page and the YouTube scene, uh, I said, this is exactly why I was hired is to kind of bring in these people and TikTok is where they are now. And they're much more accessible. And if we get in now, it's going to be much easier to draw on that audience than if we go in even a year or two later. And so I gathered all the people in the room that needed to say yes. And this is like March 2019 and uh, really overdid it with my like eight page packet that I handed each of them. Um, and it was like prereq all over again. I'm like, just let me do this. Give me class credit. And uh, they basically said yes, but it was kind of this, uh, yes, but let's kind of wait and see. And then one day in May, the guy, the head of all video walks up to me. He's like, just make a TikTok today and see what happens. He's, he said, but keep it under the radar. I was like, sure. And I did all those things, except when I posted, I was like, everyone look at this. And I was tagging people on Twitter, trying to get them to retweet it, which they did. And it, he, you know, he always jokes. He's like, I'm never going to tell you to keep something under the radar again. It's not effective. Um, but then because of the success of TikTok, it kind of snowballed, but also you had sort of the DC Beltway crowd that was excited about it and then just TikTok in general. So the numbers coming from both Twitter and TikTok were kind of um, helping me out a lot in terms of kind of getting momentum going on this thing and getting people at the Washington Post to allow me to keep doing it to the point where, you know, uh, I very intentionally just kind of made it my job. Uh, there's other things I was supposed to be doing, but over time I was like, I, I, I had to spend all my time on this account to make it work. And they're like, okay, fine. Uh, and when they saw the numbers and, you know, by the end of the year, within a few months, we already had about 300, 400,000 followers. And we had a bunch of people subscribing to the post because of the TikTok account. So all the numbers were really good. And, and basically by the time we actually reached, you know, the pandemic, I was like, this is all I want to do. Can I just make two TikToks every day? And they said, yes. I think they, at the time they said yes, because they thought we were going to be at home for three weeks. And I was like, got them. Uh, again, that wasn't really intentional, but it worked out. Um, so that's kind of how that all happened. And, and now, you know, as I mentioned, USA Today, um, or I mentioned there's other media organizations, USA Today, now this politics, uh, CBS News, there's a bunch of different places now they're doing it. And, and there's even, you know, dead singers like Frank Sinatra's on there or his estate or something. I don't know, but everyone's on TikTok now. Uh, and they're posting their original music or news or whatever. Uh, but kind of going all the way back, I'll give you the short version and maybe we can parse out pieces that interest mm -hmm. you. Uh, but I, you might remember that right after DePay, I went straight to LA within like a day uh, and was like, I'm gonna go try to write for TV or something. And, and all I got was an internship working in Jared Leto's basement, which sounds as weird as it, you think it is, <laughs> but it, he never showed up and it was just for his concert ticket company where I sold VIP tickets to like Jonas Brothers fans. And I quit that after like two months and was just working at Starbucks. And finally, actually, uh, just I would say about six or seven months in, I get a call from another DePaul alum, Colin Chicola, 
who I'd done the late night show with. And Colin said, hey, they're looking to hire someone out here in DC to, to help run this comedy website. Then I, I suggested you to, you know, and he kind of made fun of me. Like, you know, he, they asked if anyone I knew might be interested. And I said, Dave's not terrible. And so I was like, yeah, that's me. I'm not terrible. And so uh, I interviewed over the phone and they eventually kind of hired me and, and said, come out here to DC. And so that sort of comedy site became part of IJ Review ultimately ij.com, then ij, all these different things. But over three years, I went from writing kind of buzzfeedy type articles to really actually learning how to shoot and edit video and mostly was just focused on video by the time I left. And so one of my bosses there went to the post and when everyone was kind of jumping ship at IJ because they were losing money and <laughs> it was bad, I was like, please take me, take me off the ship. Uh, and so she threw me a life raft and I got to go work at the post. And that's where I've been now for uh, about three and a half years. Wow. I mean, and it's been so exciting to, to watch the progression of your talents, your skills. You know, I mean, it's just unbelievable. That's very nice. Wow. I, if you say so. <laughs> I, I, I do. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, my whole philosophy that I honestly got from DePaul, I'm not just saying this because, you know, preaching to the choir, but uh, it was very much sort of the liberal arts idea, but also the, you know, try to be good at everything. So, and, and that really works w very well. I'm sure, you know, and especially in film or just any digital video production, if you can help light or help shoot or help anything on set, you're more valuable and taking those small tasks and running with and having a positive attitude obviously helps. Uh, that kind of allows you to just kind of keep getting better at things to the point where, you know, now I feel like I'm, I can, I'm skilled at enough things where I can run a TikTok account, for instance. Clearly you can, <laughs> clearly you can. Um, so, so in related question, how do you keep coming up with this stuff every day, twice a day? How, I, I mean, think, do you, do you ever just feel like you I, can't? I definitely have the moment sometimes where it's, you know, it's cause I, I try to post them. For instance, I try to post, uh, like one by 11 or noon and then the second one by two or three. And sometimes it's 10 30 AM and I'm like, uh Oh, um, but it's not so much that I can't think of things. It's how do I make something right now that is going to be like at least somewhat related to the Washington Post, if not fully related, uh, or how do I take this news event and shove it into this meme or popular TikTok audio thing that's happening. And that's actually really fun. It actually keeps me focused to some extent, like instead of just having a million ideas and going in a bunch of different directions, there is something that's actually helpful about trying to uh, take a news event and inform people within like 15 to 45 seconds. So I do like the sort of uh, challenge of that. Um, and I think the one thing that makes it easier where I'm, I'm never like too burnt out from it, if, if at all, is because TikToks are so sort of fleeting, like literally not fleeting like Twitter, but like a Twitter fleet, but fleeting in the sense of like they the 24 hours is basically their cycle. They might kind of go viral for a couple of days, but if one is bad, most of your fans aren't going to see it, your followers, because the algorithm just kind of buries it right away. So if it was bad, who cares? I just move on to the next one. So there is a level of like, you know, it's the same, it's the same sort of philosophy of, of uh, like writing prompts every day where you're, you're, you take a prompt and you write like a couple of paragraphs and you just Maybe it's terrible, but the point is that you're exercising that creativity. So that's kind of the same idea. It's funny. I was thinking too about writing prompts, but also in terms of just the idea that uh, limitations help. You know, you were talking about the limitations of the art form. Definitely. You know, and, and how that kind of serves to generate, help you generate. Yeah. And there's and there's no shortage of news, so that helps too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can. Yeah. We can count on right now yeah, um, yeah. So, so i gotta ask i know people are, are are wondering about i mean you're a little bit famous right about now let's be honest so, I, I call so it like? <laughs> well i call it dc famous because it, it which would be the same as like you know if depa famous where you just you know you did <laughs> everyone knows you on campus well enough i i compare it to like Charles Pierre like when I got on campus like everyone knows Charles and in DC everyone knows Charles by the way I'm like walking down the street and he's just sitting there but that's a separate anyway uh but DC is like a high school where everyone here kind of knows each other which is interesting um I I I mean I really appreciate it because most of the people in DC who if they were to like hopefully my internet's still there just went unstable can you still hear me 
Okay. I, I appreciate that aspect, like in DC, where someone would recognize me only because they're, they usually have like a very specific interest in the news or politics. So they really do have like interesting things to say or questions to ask. So it is really fun in that way. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know how I define it. It's really weird because I do think that the TikTok account has gotten a lot more, uh, or at least more popular since sort of going into quarantine. So I'm kind of curious what it's going to look like on the, the other end of that, uh, yeah. where suddenly I'm not wearing a face mask on the street and I can't, you know, keep my uh, anonymity. Uh, can't even say that word. But actually, people usually recognize me for my dog. That's the thing. They'll, they'll, they'll say, oh, it's Lola. And then I'm just like, yep, that's, there she is. <laughs> Um, so no, I, I don't know. I don't know what the question exactly was, but it is, it's really cool in the sense of people recognize what you're doing and especially amongst your peers who are very involved in this specific sort of politics and news thing. It's really cool. Yeah. And I, I think I would venture to say that it goes well beyond DC, but I'll, I'll let that slide for the moment. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, maybe <laughs> I have to get out of the city first. <laughs> So, so speaking of DC, your, your approach to covering the 2020 election via TikTok was centered around informing young voters. Did, um, do you think that this was uh, influential in, in the election? And if so, in what ways? I, I really do. I, I mean, I, I, you know, there's no way to measure like what a Washington Post TikTok did to, in, to inform anyone. But I was very conscious, you know, going all the, I mean, the whole year, but especially starting in September, thinking about uh, one, you know, just general misinformation and two kind of preparing for election day and the days that follow, because I think there's, you know, understandably, a lot of people didn't expect the election to kind of last throughout the week, but most of people at the Washington Post kind of did. And I would say most people in DC sort of, they were, we were sort of prepared for this election kind of dragging on uh, just, you know, it, it's happened before and there's precedent because specifically we knew that mail-in ballots were going to take a while. So I was really focused on kind of making sure on TikTok that you had all these people who are mostly Gen Z who love, who follow our account, like know right away that by the way, before the election, we were like, I made a lot of TikToks about uh, this might be a really weird election and that there's a bunch of mail-in ballots and all these different things coming. And I was really proud of this one specific TikTok that, uh, was about that and we posted election day morning and i saw a lot of people kept going back to that and sharing it and commenting on it in the days that followed where there was sort of this uncertainty um so there's that aspect and then just like the general misinformation i really wanted to to make sure that we were not only informing people but finding pockets of misinformation and immediately addressing it um and you'll even see me sometimes in the comment section sort of like uh hopefully kindly addressing people who are spreading misinformation in the comments and kind of fact checking them. And I think it actually is really helpful. And um, TikTok is kind of this environment where at least as of today, and this could change, but it's still a pretty positive environment. And so that actually really allows for, that's like, for me, that's really conducive to dealing with misinformation as opposed to a place like Twitter where everyone is so in their own bubbles that it doesn't, that because there's no positivity to there, there's no like sort of desire for connection where I think at this point anyway, TikTok has a little bit more of a Venn diagram of conservative liberal Gen Z that still kind of interact with each other. Um, so that's really cool. And I really like that, just that overall feeling on TikTok. And that was definitely what we were working towards. And I think for the most part, we were successful. That's an interesting point. Um, and yeah, and sometimes I feel like we get uh, more of your personal political views. Um, what is the, how, how do you deal with that that balance and does the question make you nervous or does it make you nervous very often to think of those things? The question doesn't make me nervous. It certainly would make my boss nervous or my boss's boss. <laughs> um, my, I, there is this new sort of philosophy for lack of a better word amongst young journalists, which is that it's not that we should be more, uh, that, that news coverage should be partisan, it's that the moral center of the country is not necessarily the moral center of humans. And so if the moral center is kind of moving, pushing to the right where something like same Black Lives Matter is somehow considered controversial, that should, to me, that is the moral center of the country that, that should be okay to say that any journalist should be able to kind of reinforce that idea. Um, so that's kind of where I sit, where I, I never wanna like, I, I certainly 
look for opportunities to cover positive news amongst Republicans or, or bipartisanship or whatever. But for me right now, the moral center of the country is not the moral center of what humans should be or, you know, or like even just, there's just a lot of things right now where it's really tough to, to, I don't, I don't want to suffer from both sides of I guess that's the main thing. So I, I hope that kind of answers the question. So I, I like, I certainly have my own political beliefs, but I, I think for me, what, what I hope comes through, if anything, is just sort of a sense of morality or, or just compassion for humans. Um, that's, that's what I like. It's definitely my Twitter feed. That's a whole separate thing, but in terms of the TikTok feed and what's coming out there, uh, I definitely want it to just feel like this is just telling you what's happening in the country. Yeah. I think that's that's a very good answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I you did write for the DePaul some. I know while you were here. Um, right. So how do you think that I, I know some of this is sort of rote, but I I imagine you you have something to say about it. Um, how do you think traditional journalism has changed with the increase of social media platforms, and where do you see it? Sort of, do you have some sense of where it may be moving? Um, I just all just like, um, kind of every social media app kind of combined in that. Yeah, I guess so. Just sort of, yeah, I mean, I, we're, we're I, such an interesting moment. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I think, um, I think <laughs> what, what I like about having a bunch of different social media companies is that there it, like it doesn't all become folk like if everyone were on twitter it'd be i think everything would be worse if ever but really a small like really just about 10 percent of americans are even on twitter at all um and i like that there's different pockets of places for different conversation um in terms of like where it's going to go i think i mean on a more basic level i think everything video is just gonna i think video is just gonna keep growing in its own way you see the whole reason that twitter did fleets is because i think and i know they sort of mentioned this is that fleets are video based and twitter realized in the last like three or four years that videos have been like exponentially bigger on twitter which is why i post all the tiktoks there because i know that video does really well on twitter so i think everything is becoming more video based i think what's interesting going forward is going to see how smart people are about kind of identifying things that are um you know, misleading or, or just false altogether. And I do think being on TikTok that the younger generation kind of gets it. Like they're sort of becoming much, they kind of call BS immediately on things. So I hope that social media kind of keeps going that direction where uh, one, it's sort of trying to become fact-based, mm -hmm. but two, there's um, just a sense of trying to be more like actually real, not like real world real, but like literally real. Uh, because the other thing that I see on TikTok a lot is that this culture of um, not being too shiny or made up or something, people kind of poke fun at, at sort of the Instagram life that's not real. Well, that's a really good point. Um, so I think I have an idea about this myself, but you, and I don't know if you want to say, but where would, where would you like to be in 10 years? I mean, five years, let's say five years. Oh, um, my wife asked me this two days ago and I, I had a hard time answering, uh, which is bad. I, I, like I, I have a bunch of different goals and um, uh, aspirations. I mean, for me, the goal that probably is still the same from college is that I would like to work on a late show and or write or, or host in some capacity. Uh, you know, every, you can kind of see where Colbert Report is still just kind of echoing in everything that I do in terms of just like, even, even the way like he would present something or write about something. Like I'm very much still in that mindset of using satire or comedy to inform, but also to, to just kind of, you know, poke fun at what's happening literally today. Uh, so that's still kind of the direction I would go. I want to be, but it's, it's hard to see what that path is now. There's way too many late shows and I'm aware of that, but maybe it's kind of to the point where because there's so many, everyone kind of has a different audience that they can play to. And maybe that's a good thing. Um, I don't know. What do you, what do you think? What, what was your <laughs> guess going to be? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Okay. I mean, you yeah. know, uh, it, I feel like we see it all the time. I, it, I mean, I'm sure that I don't, I remember, I don't know what the number was that was cited earlier, the amount of views that you've had, but I, I can't help but think that an awful lot of those people have had that thought um, that you would be yeah. awfully good for that. So I, I'm, I'm rooting for you and I'm, I'm convinced 
that it's going to happen myself, but not to jinx it. And I'm, I'm knocking on wood on your path. We'll, we'll um, meet back here in seven years and see. see okay, happens. we'll talk about it then. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, we can move to audience questions uh, now. If folks have any questions, they can just, uh, I believe they can just unmute themselves yeah, I, and show their camera and say something. Uh, okay, there's the one that's been, okay. Should I just answer that one in the chat there? Sure. So what's the ideation process like for creating each TikTok? Coming up with an original uh, idea is always a challenge. So, so much, so how much are you influenced from other trends on social media versus trying to create true original content? That's a good question. Yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, try to explain as best I can. So um, I wish I could, it's funny, like as soon as I make a TikTok, I forget the next day what I made. So because I'm off this week, I, I can't even think of a recent example, but basically what happens is I'll, I'll wake up um, and the first thing I kind of am looking at before 8 a.m. is, is there any trendy news that's already happening at this moment? Like, is there anything that I could, if I took the headline, you would at least get what the story is about and hopefully go read more about it. So I look for a lot of, I, I mean, I literally go the wash because I, I, I try to get Washington Post articles specifically and I'm looking at different headlines and see if it, any of those headlines have like within that headline and maybe within the first paragraph or lead, there is enough information there that between 15 and 30 seconds, I could kind of inform someone about what's happening. Um, and usually I find something like one or two things. And so once those are in my head, then I go on TikTok and I'm kind of scrolling from anywhere from, from 10 minutes to over an hour. And I'm just sort of seeing what's trending uh, the way I see what's trending and what I defined as trending on TikTok is something that was posted within the last one or two days. And it's either a sound that someone created, like it's just them filming around their apartment and everyone's kind of using the dialogue and, and mouthing it, or it's this specific kind of song or, or some kind of just general idea. Uh, like I'll give a recent example is people keep taking a, a Christmas ornament, like a bulb like this. And they they throw it in a room like it's a grenade, and then it flashes, and then the room is decorated like Christmas. So that's like the th that like that's a very recent idea that I'm like, oh, I'm definitely gonna do that. Which I already filmed the first half of it actually earlier before my apartment started looking like Christmas at DU. Um, so there's that sort of level of um, like just trying to fit it into that box with that meme. And so I'll, I'll usually try to make that one first and post it by noon. And then the second one. If I posted one that's kind of informative, I kind of give myself a little leeway to just kind of post something that's fun if I can. Uh, I usually try to incorporate the Washington Post, even if it's just like a newspaper or something. I, I don't have my can of spam near me, but there's a can of spam I have named Sam, but now he wears a newspaper hat, so I don't feel guilty if it's nothing to do with the Washington Post. Um, and so there's, yeah, that, that's kind of the ideation process of like, let's see if I can take these two things. Um, I hope I kind of have that. There's a second part to this. But in terms of the very last part, actually, about true original content, um, what's cool about TikTok and kind of difficult at first to wrap your head around is nothing is, unless you do a very original TikTok, which I do try to do, that's usually the second TikTok in the day where it's like a sketch, basically, or just something unrelated to what I've seen on the app. Um, everything else is kind of people building on the joke. So if I do a meme that I've already seen, I always try to add something to it. So that makes it original. But for the most part, everyone's kind of building on the same thing until you kind of arrive at like this really funny meme that all of TikTok has created. Wow, who okay. knew? <laughs> so I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you, do you want to just, uh, you can see I'll, these Q&As. Right? Yeah, yeah. The this Q is from Caroline, an old prereq alum. Uh, you've been able to get quite a few famous DC faces in your TikToks. Do you make appointments with these people running? Okay, that's... Uh, that's great. Happy to, happy to see you too, by the way. Um, I can't see you, but happy to see that you've written something. Um, so, uh, the, probably the best example of what you're thinking of is presidential candidates. We got, um, six total, including Biden by the end, uh, though Biden was virtual. Um, really, honestly, at first it, it was, uh, kind of a little bit of luck was mixed in just like anything. But, uh, the first candidate we got was Andrew Yang who just happened to be at the post for a, a post live Q and a thing, which was separate from anything I do. Uh, but the guy who was running his digital campaign at the time and throughout his camp presidential campaign um, was like a huge fan of our TikToks. And so he reached out to me before they got there and said, I would love to do a TikTok with you guys. 
And I was like, that would be amazing. Uh, and I sent him a couple ideas and one idea was my favorite, but I just, I didn't think he would say yes to it. And I gave him another idea that I knew was terrible. Um, so he actually said yes to the first idea without even fully understanding it. And like basically the premise, just to boil it down without going too into it, is Andrew Yang is just dancing to his really low polling numbers. So it's just him for 15 seconds dancing to like a 3% in front of him. And he's got like, I gave him a tie because he like famously never wore ties in the debate and he's swinging it around. He's got on his head and he did all that in like three minutes and he was great. And because he did that and because the reaction on TikTok and Twitter was so positive, then we kind of started to build a little bit of momentum once again, like anything with TikTok. And we got Beto to do one about five days later. Um, and then the very next day we got Julian, or I think that was the next one, was Julian and Juan Castro. And that's probably the, the, the best one because, sorry, Julian and Joaquin Castro, because they, like me, they're always confusing them for the other one. On, on national like television, everyone's always calling Joaquin Julian and vice versa. So we did a TikTok about that. And after that, I was kind of like, it, it, it was just sort of um, people were coming to us more often than I was going to them. The last one I had to go to was, was Joe Biden. I really had to chase that one down, especially when it became clear that he was probably going to get the nomination. I, I really wanted to get that. And luckily they said yes. Um, but just like DC, it was kind of about connections. Um, this is the last part of it. But uh, with the person that was running Beto's digital campaign went to go work for Biden as soon as Beto dropped out. So I basically just emailed him again and said, let's do this again. And that's how that worked out. Yeah, those were great. I loved those, that series. I did see a, oh, there's a bunch of questions now. Well, to answer Cam's question, this decor is wonderful and I'm glad you appreciate it. I think that, I think he deleted it though. I can kind of go through these. I see that. Do you see the Q and A thing? Do you want me to? I do. Oh, yeah. I'm going to suggest okay. you know you might as well uh, just let folks know what the question was. Okay, I'll read. Uh, Barry asks, "What at Tapa aided you in starting to develop your sense of the moral center?" Uh, that's a really good question. I don't. I mean, I'm sure there was factors at Tapa that certainly led me there. Um, but for me, the sort of idea of a moral center, and and I. I I hope that term best fits what I'm saying. I think it does. It's just kind of looking at the last four or five years where things have become so sort of, we've become so numb to so many things that I constantly am kind of trying to think what is the actual, like, where is the center of the country versus where is like what I perceive as the moral center. So I don't know how much of DePa helped me in that. I, I guess the, if I could try to answer that, it would, it would be, um, and, and not just because I have a bunch of brothers here, but I think a big part of my time at DU was was very much, um, uh, well, it was all very positive, but I was just surrounded by a lot of people who were just really good guys. And I think if I, and I very intentionally like wanted to be around that because uh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm a, a follower at all, but I think that to some extent, I, I if I'm around people that I, I know that I, respect and like, I will start to emulate that. So I think that there is a little bit of that with DU where uh, a lot of my brothers there are just really good guys. And a lot of them are asking really ridiculous questions, but they're otherwise, they're, they're pretty good guys. <laughs> well, that's great. It's great that you feel that way. Definitely. I'll wait for Anna to draw. Okay. <laughs> okay, there's speaking of. From Quinn, if you had one TikTok to explain what TikTok is to a grandparent, what would it be? Oh man, I was just thinking about this the other day because my grandma has something, it's literally, it's an app called GrandPad and they've given her some kind of iPad and we're supposed to upload photos to the GrandPad app. And she she looks at the pictures and then she voice comments on them. Uh, it's been mostly a disaster, but it's adorable. Um, but I was trying to think the other day, like what can I screenshot or send to her that she would understand as a TikTok? I think it's the ones that are just like, um, and I, I can think of one specific one, but it's usually like a TikTok where there's text above you and there's music playing and it's just one shot. So there was one that I did way back in like June where it was me going on my two day vacation during the pandemic. And it was just me moving from one chair to another while send me on my way plays. Um, and so it was just like, 
the joke is that I'm just shutting my laptop and now I'm just going to watch TV for three days. Uh, and that's like really easy for people to understand because it's just like, it's all there. It's one thing. And then it just, you just keep watching on loop until you basically understand it. Uh, if you were trying to show your grandparent a TikTok that was a bunch of different shots and like had all these different vocab words, <laughs> you know, new trendy words that they wouldn't understand, then that wouldn't work. But if it's just that simple thing that that's especially something that if it's something that you like to watch on a loop a lot, it's probably something that's pretty universal. That's like the best thing about TikTok is when they're really, really viral, it's because they're just, you can just watch them forever. Uh, and that probably makes them more relatable to, to your grandparents. Okay, I'm Wendy, Wendy, yeah. Uh, Wendy asks, as a child of the 60s and a former editor of the DePa, help me on how TikTok is journalism and not entertainment. Um, I, I would um, I'd point you to probably the last, again, I'm off this week. So from last Friday, the last Monday through Friday, that last week, and, and in general, but those last 10 TikToks or 11 TikToks that I posted, I would say the majority of them were, were news-based. And certainly there's entertainment because uh, that's the app itself. And I always kind of make this comparison that TikTok is sort of like a, a dinner party. And we've been invited to this TikTok dinner party, but we're not the host. We just we just brought our own Washington Post dish. And we're just kind of there to, to be part of the TikTok world, as anyone should be. It's, you know, you shouldn't try to dictate uh, either the conversation or just the sort of what TikTok is. So I always try to approach TikTok as I'm one of you guys. Um, so that's kind of baked into the TikToks, but there's a lot of information that we have on the very last TikTok was just this one really long 60 second TikTok. And it's this meme that's been on TikTok for a while where the 50 nifty United States plays. And it's like, you know, Alabama, Alaska. Arizona. And usually what people do is it'll be like, I don't know, it'll be anything like these states have, like crime is legal in these states. I don't know. Like you can't be in a bathtub because there's weird state laws like that. And they'll, they'll do, um, they'll jump to the state where like that applies to the state. And this one, I just did states where election widespread election fraud has been found. And I just stood in one corner the whole time while the whole song played. Um, and the whole point was there hasn't been any election fraud in any of these states. That's a lot of misinformation that's going on TikTok and elsewhere. And so there was some information in that, and as I kind of mentioned before, a lot of what we do is sort of tackling misinformation on TikTok, which I would, I would certainly say is journalism. And I try to do it in a way that's, you know, keeps people's interest and of course is entertaining too. Excellent. Hey, Dave. Yes. Can I make a production request? Please. Can we have the fireplace back? It's so distracting. <laughs> I didn't know it was on. It's going Unless you guys want to watch Claws. Yeah. Uh, why don't you read the next question while I find the remote? That's hilarious. Okay, that's a good before. idea. That's a very good idea. It's a question that, here's one that I I really personally like by Emma Workowski. Is there a class that you wish you had taken while you were at DePaul or a subject you always wanted to study but never got the chance to? Huh. I never thought about it too much. So I, clearly I don't have, oh, you know what? There was a bunch of film studies classes that I wanted to take. And it was only because if I didn't sign up fast enough, I would lose the spot. And I never signed up fast enough, like to the point where sometimes I didn't have classes because I, um, so yeah, there was a bunch and, and actually, and this is no, again, this is my fault, but I wasn't even able to get a film studies minor because I couldn't sign up for these classes in time to get the required <laughs> classes I wanted. Um, you know, I, I don't like hearing that, but, but we, you know, I know. And I, I, again, that's my, like, I waited way too long. Everything winter term, uh, when I came to DePa, I didn't sign up for a dorm, like before until like a week before or something, or I didn't set up the information. So it's a whole, um, but yeah, I, I, uh, any of this, I wish, I wish I could have taken a lot more film classes. There was, and there's a lot of great film professors there. I wish I, I only had really one class with JMP for instance. Uh, and I wish I would have had a lot more with him and, and all the other professors in that department. Awesome. Well, um, maybe we'll have you back though to, to do a film studies lecture one day, but I'll, I'll, too late. perfect. I'll have the, I'll make sure the fire's playing behind me. Yeah, please claws. do. Do you want to find another question or do, would you want me to? Uh, yeah. I'll, uh... Oh, how about this one? Yeah. What's the best yeah. advice you could give to an English writing major currently at DePaul? Um, you know, I think what worked for me and, and I, I think I might've mentioned this a little bit earlier was to an extent was, uh, kind of going into your career post to paw, willing to sort of say yes to any project. Um, and once you're, and especially, you know, for me, what ended up happening was I, I went to go work at like an online news site. 
Uh, and I just kind of said yes to everything they asked me to do. Um, as long as it was something I was comfortable with, obviously, but I mean, at, at yes to like, can you help dress this set? Can you help, I don't know, edit this article? Can you, at one point, at one point they had me like do the entire about section and our, and our, um, what's it like our guidelines and regulations. I, just, I was told to write those, which is like probably not good, but I did that. Um, and so I would take on little tasks like that just all the time. And I think, you know, that obviously applies to any major, but I think for me as an English writing major, I specifically was trying to, I was trying to get myself in places where I could write something or in some ways do something that was in my interest, even if that specific task at that company or place wasn't totally related to it. I, I think just kind of having a positive attitude is as, as silly and maybe even naive as it sounds, it's not naive. You really should just kind of continue to be positive and um, allow yourself to just try different things. Just say yes. Exactly. And keep your eyes open for the next opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, it, the story you told about your trajectory was really inspirational that way, I think. Yeah, I, you know, and, um, and I think I was always surrounded by, or I was lucky enough to have really good managers or bosses. Um, and when I, for me, that was the only thing that really mattered was if I had someone who was in charge of me that cared about what I was doing. Uh, and I was, that's, that, that is important because if you do find a manager or boss that maybe is not helping you at all, maybe that might be the one sign of, I don't know about this place, but if there's someone that is interested in helping you out or, or, you know, in some way, then that's a really good situation to be in. Absolutely. Would you like to, there's so many questions I can't. I, yeah, I can, I'll just. Uh, why don't you see if there's uh, one that hits you? I guess we probably won't have time to get to them all, but we might. Yeah, I got uh, this This one at the top of the Q&A for me. Oh, there's, or maybe I'll just look at what, I'll try to get my best. Okay, this one's from Ben. Uh, hi, Ben. I haven't talked to Ben forever. Great to see you. Thanks for doing this. I agree with you that Gen Z is a really solid basis for determining misinformation and advanced level scrutiny for the things they see online but they are only one piece of the internet and social media pie. Very true. What do you think are broader strategies to aiding that process across platforms and age groups that keeps the spirit of free speech alive? Any thoughts? Um, yeah, and of course, when I, Ben's absolutely right that um, Gen Z is not, is in fact, at this point, a very small piece of the pie because the country itself is actually much older than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago, like literally within that pie. Um, so uh, th that's, that is very difficult to me. I do it's not that I value what Gen Z thinks more, but I value what platforms they're using more because just like Facebook, when it first came out in 2004, you know, the younger people were, are, were on Facebook first and then everyone else kind of followed suit. So for me, it's not that the other demographics aren't important. It's just that most people kind of follow where that younger demographic is and that becomes the new big social media hub. Um, but in terms of trying to, uh, the spirit of keeping free speech alive and, and addressing everything that's happening, I think you just have to be as proactive as possible. It's, it seems like it's a seemingly impossible task to just be fact checking everything. But I think, you know, if you're clearly committed to it and you're doing it in a good faith way, people start to notice. And I think that's happened in our TikTok account a lot too, is that a lot of things that were like, I don't think there's anything we've posted that's like outwardly negative. Um, like nothing is necessarily like snarky like twitter i would say it's all very like I, if, if it's something that might be kind of satirical i'm kind of doing it with a smile on my face there's like almost a general positivity about it but i think that kind of going going forth and doing things in good faith and constantly trying to hold people accountable without being a butthole <laughs> uh it is effective and i think especially if it's not that the younger generation is the most important but that is kind of where everyone's going to follow suit so i'm hoping right now to sort of establish that with the Washington Post account on TikTok. Excellent. Um, Josh Block says, do you have an approval process with editors at the Washington Post? Sounds like you have a lot of freedom to create and post what you want. What feedback do you get from your editors? Do the journalistic standards that apply to other content creators or journalists apply to you? It's a great question. Uh, yes, yes to all of that. Uh, and it's always, just, I think people are often surprised about that. Um, but everything has to be approved by at least one person who's my boss. And if she has any sort of um, misgivings or, or just like if, if a flag pops up in her head, uh, she'll go to the next person. And then if, you know, the worst case scenario is when they go to Marty Baron 
and Marty Baron, who is our executive editor is great, but he doesn't know anything about TikTok. So whenever it goes to him for approval, he usually just rejects it. He's like, I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> um, but for the most part, uh, the, everything, I would say 99.5% of things are approved. And I would say like 30 to 40% of things have some kind of edit, whether it be um, something that is within the Washington Post style guide where I'm using, like if I'm using an abbreviation correctly for a state, anything like as small as that to, oh no, we don't use that word. Oh, uh, we don't use the word president elect until we've officially announced Joe Biden in an article or, or we don't capitalize president elect all these different types of, they're all going into every single TikTok. And the, like, there's usually, I would say the TikToks take about two to three hours to make sometimes less, but then the approval process is at least another half hour to 45 minutes in terms of just making sure we got all the details right. Um, so there is, a, I, I, my goal is to make it all look effortless. I want it to kind of just feel like, um, this is the TikTok account and you're getting this because I, 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 you know, literally I want to feel a little bit sort of fireside chatty, like just this kind of, I am your guide to what's happening in the news for TikTok because I don't want it to feel too shiny and official. Um, so that is the vibe I want to give off. But in terms of, you know, making sure everything's factual was within our standards and all that, that's all checked with every single TikTok. Excellent. Um, here's one that says, hi, my name's Colleen Maynard class of 2023. Hello. As a young person and someone who spends more than an hour every day on TikTok, embarrassingly, one of my biggest concerns with TikTok is the commercialization of the platform. I'm worried that the app's algorithm will continue pushing ads over small creators. Do you have any thoughts on this and how do you walk this line between being relatable and doing your job? Okay, so I'll, I'll preface this by saying that uh, my, my wife always says that I'm, I'm like too much of a fanboy of TikTok. So I, I just want to say that what I'm about to say, I think is true. But you know, I'm also someone that loves TikTok. And, and I also have, I would say a pretty good working relationship with the people at TikTok. Because um, as you may know, anyone that has a verified account or, you know, a business account as we do, there is some contact at TikTok or multiple people that you can talk to and ask questions and all these kinds of things. Um, what's really, the reason I mentioned that is because um, the creator funded TikTok is something that is fully like a TikTok idea or, or it was really something that TikTok championed. Whereas um, the creator fund is basically like they're giving money back to their creators, their most popular creators, and they're adding them to this, this group of people. And they're really trying very hard to show the creators that they value them. Um, now, of course, smaller creators, you know, I don't know what that means for smaller creators, if that sort of puts them further away from being seen. I haven't noticed that yet, though, and they've had the creator fund going for a few months. Um, but what I really like about generally them having this creator fund and also just really genuine, actually listening to what people have to say uh, and, and requests they have is that that's very different from YouTube. When YouTube, like, you know, infamously has been pretty terrible to its creators um, and they've kind of allowed bad things, bad people to get bigger platforms and people that are not doing bad things to kind of, you know, stutter and, and fall away. So um, I really like that about TikTok. And I think that they're, they are trying to build that sort of environment that's very um, welcoming in that way. Um, in terms of the, being more ads on TikTok, I really don't know the answer. Uh, what's interesting for the Washington Post is uh, we've, ha we've had a few people approach us about, you know, selling products. Um, but it's within the, the Washington Post guidelines that me as a journalist employee working for the Post cannot say, I use Samsung's to make TikToks, which isn't true, by the way, but they, they had that request. Um, so I can't do that. Like that would be without, outside of our, whatever, our moral guidelines. And um, if we did to. do ads, it would have to be just unrelated. And I could not be in it personally in any way endorsing the product. So. Um, I, I, that's for news organizations. And I think that's pretty, pretty similar across the board. You know, I, I don't think the USA Today could do that. I don't think CBS News could do that. So we're kind of stuck in that way. And, and I kind of hope that other organizations kind of stick to that as well, where we're making money through the creator fund rather than through ads. But, um, you know, like any platform, I'm, I'm betting that there will be more ads, but I do think that they are, you know, consciously trying to make it still a good experience for smaller creators. I, I got to ask though, I, I know I'm not the only one who's thinking this. What about spam? <laughs> uh, spam. <laughs> if there's anybody here who's unfamiliar with Dave's TikToks, he's, how would you describe it? Do you have it nearby? Yeah, let me hold, give me three seconds. Hold on. Dave has a partner 
in his TikToks, who shows up relatively often. And he's he going a, he has a British accent. He's now. one of my friends. Uh, there we go. Partner. Over. So this is this is Sam. That's and Sam. this is Pam, his girlfriend, who I need to to work on. She she has doesn't have a hand yet. She's still anyway. But Sam is my 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 best friend here uh, in the apartment. Uh, besides Mariana, my wife. But uh, in the TikToks, Sam is someone that I talk to uh, constantly. And uh, that, that was that <laughs> the whole joke. And I'm sorry, I'm getting away from the actual question. But the whole the whole joke with Sam was that I wanted to make it seem like I was going crazier in quarantine every day. But like I got way ahead of myself. So by like mid-April, I was already just a completely insane person. And a lot of people believed it, which was great. But I, then I we started to realize, oh, we're going to be here for a while. So I had to kind of tone it down for a while. But I imagine once we get closer to the sort of end of quarantine date, you'll start to see things ramping up more with, with Sam. Um, no, but Spam, uh, I, I reached out to Spam because we wanted to use um, Sam's image in um, a few like Washington Post uh, merchandise, TikTok gear related things. And Spam, the, the person at Spam and marketing personally reached out and he said, we love your TikToks, but we don't do that kind of stuff. But we just want you to know that we've been watching and we love it. <laughs> so at least we have the endorsement of, the people at spam like what we're doing but they uh no they won't allow us to to use sam's likeness <laughs> excellent so here's a, a question from a first year student at depaul who wants to know what was the hardest class you took at depaul and i don't know if that's because they want to avoid that class or they want to go <laughs> and take it um okay well th this is a, this is a little unfair because it was kind of outside my interests and it was again it was a it was a side effect of signing up too late for classes i had to take i don't remember what i, I couldn't tell you the, the requirement like there was letters or something it was one of those required classes you had to take um to get your degree in general and it had it was an economic class and it was called economic writing and i walk into that class and i was like well it's writing so uh but it turned out you actually had to have like you were, you're like very much encouraged to have taken like Ecom 101 beforehand. And I had not, um, but they just kind of ignored that. And that class was, was so hard for me. I, you know, I know my, my dad majored in economics. I, I, it did not pass on in any way. Uh, my mom was an English professor and my grandpa was uh, my mom's side, a bunch of English professors, my dad's side that did not come in. However, I did learn a lot um, through that class, I mean, you know, it was extremely difficult, but I, I did stumble across a few things and actually like we were each assigned to a different part of some kind of economic, I can't even use the language anymore, but I, I was assigned to uh, specifically follow the unemployment rate throughout that semester, which your last semester of senior year, that's a really fun thing to follow uh, at the end, in the middle or the end of the recession is the un unemployment rate numbers. Uh, but that's what I was assigned to. And actually, I still have a reminder on my phone the first Friday of every month to check the unemployment rate. And I never took it off because I just think it's funny. Um, but yeah, so that was definitely the most difficult class. But um, I don't I don't know about English. I, I loved all my English writing classes. They, they, a lot of them were very difficult in their own way, but I, I love them so much that I, that's, I mean, that's what I was at the paw for really. So um, yeah. I think, I, but economic writing, that's the answer. Yeah, which connects to another question someone asked, what made you choose DePaul over other universities? Well, I, I, don't, I don't even know if uh, Anna, the person who facilitated this, know this, but I, I transferred to DePaul. So I, I came in sophomore year um, and I was, and it, it was kind of one of those, like, I, I, I liked the where I was. I went to the University of Tulsa freshman year. I really enjoyed it. It wasn't like a, I, I had picked that school because I, I, really felt comfortable on the campus and I and I sure I still would to this day but their English department was was bad it was basically non-existent and then I'd, I I kind of thought well what are their internships like and I asked an English professor who I'd had a class with and he was super nice but he's like well you can like maybe intern for Tulsa film something I was like okay um so uh I was I kind of had it kind of reached that point where I was like do I stick around and try to make this work or or do I go to what was my second choice which was DePa and uh, I ended up, the, the very long story short is I ended up transferring to DePaul and I was really excited about, I got into the media fellows program uh, as a transfer, which was, I think kind of the final, like what really convinced me to do it was the media fellows program. So um, I forget what the actual question was, was, it what, was it why did I choose DePaul? But it was for all those reasons. It was the internships. It was the, I, I when I visited, I had a, a class with Sununu. Um, so all of these things at once convinced me that I should, should uh, transfer.
Oh, beautiful. And we're so glad you did, aren't we, Anna? <laughs> Yeah, yes. I was going to say you were right. I did not know that you transferred and that is awesome. Also, I think if you have Sununu when you go through DePaul, it's like a rite of passage. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I ended up telling her later, like two years after I transferred, I'm like, you're the reason I'm here. And she was like, ha oh. ha was amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I sounded just like her. Time. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I love her so much. Yeah. But she was, she's great. Um, well, for all of you who still have questions in the, in the queue, know that they are not going to go away. I have copied them all down and I will send them to Dave so he can, you know, answer your burning yeah. questions. You, they, you will get them answered. But there were some shout outs that I wanted to read to you. So Marilyn says, hi, Dave, miss you around the Media Fellows office. So obviously she wanted to say hi. Um, and right. Grant Walters said, no questions, just giving a shout out. Congrats on everything, Dave. <laughs> the best kind of question. Not a question. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. This one is, obviously you have to answer it. Um, this person says they're a junior at DePauw and they have to ask, what is your go-to Marvin's order? Um, uh, you know, someone at DePauw asked me this the other week. I, I mean, when I first got there, it was... GCB because everyone says over the GCB um, but ultimately it just became like the as much pizza as I could consume in one sitting um, with ranch or anything and yeah so it's it's really I think it really is was the pizza and I don't I haven't had the pizza in the daytime so I don't know if I'd endorse it but it was pretty good at 2 a.m so <laughs> awesome that is yeah so uh jnp says thanks for doing this um oh. wish you'd been in all of his classes <laughs> <laughs> well he you know i had the one class and then i had a separate class with jmp which was just uh me doing the pre-record late night show and him being like my sponsor or something and i just had to email him once a month so that was great uh he was a great professor in that class where i emailed him five times Awesome. Well, I just wanted to thank you once again for doing this and for giving your time to old DePaw. We really, really appreciated it. Um, we appreciate when you wear your DePaw shirts in your TikToks because we get to watch them and go, oh, he's wearing DePaw stuff. Like we love it. Yes. Love the swag. Um, thank you, Professor, for agreeing to join us tonight. I really appreciate you both. And for the audience members out there, thank you for coming because we hope this could bring some holiday joy to you. I know Dave's background gave me some holiday joy for sure. Yes. Yeah. I hope that, I hope this did the touch. I don't know. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all for coming and we will see you again in the new year. Thank you, Thanks, Dave. Everyone. Thanks, Bye. Anna. Bye. Bye.